YWCA, Greater Los Angeles, serving the community and its people for more than 100 years with outstanding programs such as its community advocacy program, child development services, sexual assault crises counseling program, the empowerment project for senior citizens, its youth education training, and the renowned LA Job Corps. The YWCA has been firmly established as the city's foremost charitable organization. But there was one such program that went on to become a legend in the annals of Hollywood history. The story begins in 1916 when Mrs. Eleanor Jones, a librarian at the Hollywood Public Library, provided a space for a group of aspiring young actresses to rehearse plays. It was the birth of the Hollywood Studio Club. But within a few short years, the Society of Actresses outgrew the facility and were forced to relocate to a stately house on Carlos Avenue, which provided just enough living and rehearsal space for about 20 women. A gossip columnist at the time described the house as more of a sorority with a delightful motion picture atmosphere. By the time the National Board of the YWCA took control over the club in 1918, the Carlos Avenue property had already outgrown its usefulness. But under the direction of Constance DeMille, wife of producer Cecil B. DeMille and chairwoman of the Hollywood YWCA, an aggressive campaign was launched to raise the funds for a new and larger facility in Hollywood. Commissioned to build the structure was Julia Morgan, seen here with publishing tycoon William Randolph Hearst. It was Morgan who would build Hearst's sprawling castle on the central California coast, La Cuesta Encantada. <laughs> the spectacular estate covered over 90,000 square feet and is open today for the enjoyment of the visiting general public. For the studio club, Morgan chose a three-story classic Mediterranean style, which became home to more than 10,000 young women during its 45-year lifespan. Like many of Morgan's buildings, the structure incorporated a more liberated mission style, with tile roofs, decorative coins, and a triple-vaulted archway accented by a pair of oversized cast iron entry lights. Despite two imposing wings on either end of the building, it's the main entrance that serves as the focal point. Here, newcomers to Hollywood would get their first look at their new home away from home. Recently, when a film production company decorated the building to appear as it did in the late 1950s, they discovered that much of the building's original charm and character remained unchanged. From the old reception desk, right down to the original mailboxes. The south wing of the building consisted of the rehearsal hall on the ground floor and bedrooms on the two upper floors. Its identical twin on the north end housed the dining room and second and third floor bedrooms. Meals were served twice daily and consisted of juice, coffee, cereal, eggs and toast for breakfast, 
And for dinner, it was one meat dish and three vegetables, along with coffee, milk, or apple juice. For dessert, there was jello. Ah, but on Sunday mornings, there was hot buttered coffee cake. It was the dining room that served as a popular gathering area for the latest Hollywood gossip. An enormously long hallway stretches from the dining room to the rehearsal hall at the opposite end of the building. Complementing the dining room in size, the room, like many others in the building, appears as it did more than 70 years ago. Advanced reservations were required if a girl wanted to practice her craft. Marilyn Monroe, seen here, along with other aspiring young actresses, could rehearse scenes, prepare for auditions, practice dance routines, or even take singing lessons. Today, the rehearsal hall is used for conferences and seminars. The centerpiece of Morgan's liberated design is the inner courtyard. Not only decorative, but practical for such important things as, well, uh, sunbathing. <coughs> Connecting the front of the building to the rear were two canopied twin walkways, which led from the reception area to the library. Maintaining much of its original character, minus, of course, a few pieces of updated furniture, the room, by the mid-1950s, became a very popular gathering place for watching television. Several stairways, strategically placed throughout the building, led to the second and third floor bedrooms. Hallways traversed the entire rear of the building and along the north and south wings as well. Initially, a double room was just $15 a week, and a single or private ran an extra 10. Two meals a day were included. But by the early 1960s, the price had dramatically risen to $80 for a double and $90 for a single, breakfast and dinner included. Most of the girls, however, would just skip lunch, opting out instead for some fruit or a sandwich at the nearby Hollywood Ranch Market. Some of the studio club's most famous residents included America's sweetheart, Mary Pickford, novelist and playwright, Ayn Rand, actress Peggy Entwistle, who finally achieved the fame she so desperately pursued when she leaped to her death from the letter H of the Hollywood sign. There was 1940s screen star, Maureen O'Sullivan, and Linda Darnell, who splashed onto the screen opposite Tyrone Power in The Mark of Zorro. Tragically, Darnell, a Texas beauty queen, died only one day after suffering massive burns resulting from a house fire in 1965. The angelic Donna Reed, star of The Donna Reed Show in the 1960s, and a little low-budget film called It's a Wonderful Life. Today, that film is considered a classic and one of the holiday season's most popular movies. Barbara Britton was a star throughout the 1940s and 50s in both film and television. And unlike other Hollywood hopefuls, Kim Novak had already struck it rich by the time she moved into the studio club. Shelley Winters had a career that lasted 60 years but it was a pouty little brunette by the name of Norma Jean Doherty who would go on to become a legend in the pages of Hollywood history. It was while living at the studio club that she was transformed into the sexy blonde bombshell named Marilyn Monroe. Studio club blondes reigned supreme throughout the 1950s and 60s with stars like the voluptuous Dorothy Malone, and a cute little cheerleader from Tucson, Arizona by the name of Barbara Eden. Her popular series, I Dream of Jeannie, 
remained a hit with television audiences for five seasons. And then there was Charlie's favorite angel, Farrah Fawcett, whose style was emulated by at least half the young women in America. But perhaps no other story in the history of the studio club is more horrifying and shocking than that of Sharon Tate. On the night of August 8, 1969, the fashion model and cover girl turned actress, along with four others, were brutally murdered by members of the notorious Manson family. At the time, she was eight and a half months pregnant. The lights finally went out of the legendary Hollywood Studio Club in February of 1975. Two years later, it was declared a Los Angeles landmark, and by the end of the decade, it was listed in the National Registry as a historical landmark. It was also in 1977 that the L.A. Jobs Corps moved into the building until the spring of 2012, when the building was vacated. But there was one brief moment when the Hollywood Studio Club was brought back to life, when a film production company recreated the building just as it was in the late 1950s. The film? The Studio Club. Today, the building awaits its next occupant. Perhaps it'll be your organization, company, or club that'll be the next to join the ranks of history in the great tradition of the Studio Club and the YWCA, Greater Los Angeles.